Um, welcome to those of you who have logged in already. Um, first, I'll introduce you to myself. Uh, my name is Nicole Basaraba, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at Studio Europa Maastricht. And my um, research focuses on the topic of identity heritage and the citizen's perspective. And I'll be your host for today's event. Um, I'd also like to take a moment to introduce to you two other researchers at Studio Europa, who are also the co-organizers of this event, and they'll also be co-moderating with me as well. So firstly, we have Claire Fenwick, who is a postdoctoral researcher focusing on the theme of prosperity, welfare, and inequality. And then we have Akuto McGee, who is a PhD researcher in history, examining the EU's internal integration capacity on a policy level and from a historical perspective. So before I introduce you our speakers, I will also give you a brief introduction to Studio Europa Maastricht in case you're not familiar. Um, we are affiliated with Maastricht University and the studio acts as a meeting place for citizen dialogue and debate. It is a center of excellence for multidisciplinary research on Europe and it shares stories that engage citizens and the heritage of Europe beginning with the Maastricht Treaty. For instance, Studio Europa will be hosting the upcoming European Citizen Summit for the Conference on the Future of Europe in cooperation with the European Institute of Public Administration. And we host many other events like today's, which is titled Research with Impact, Effectively Influencing Policymaking Processes. So that brings me to, to why we're all here actually and why we've gathered, um, because today's event aims to bridge the gap between academic research and policy making processes at the European Union and national levels. From our fantastic lineup of speakers, we're going to hear some best practices and techniques on how researchers can extend the impact of their work by translating their results towards influencing policy. So on that note, I'll introduce you to our first speaker. Um, we have talk, Dr. Thomas Jorgensen. He is a senior policy coordinator at European University Association, which represents 800 universities across 48 countries. He ensures coherent policies for universities, overall policy development, and managing cross-cutting issues with policy relevance. He has worked on topics including sustainable development, Brexit, and EU foreign policy. Previously, Dr. Jorgensen was the head of the Council for Doctoral Education at the EUA for several years, and he received his PhD in History and Civilization from the European University Institute in Florence in 2004. And he's worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Copenhagen and the University of Libre de Bruxelles. So we welcome you as our first speaker. And after the closing of your speech, we will hold questions to the end so that um, uh, Claire can introduce our, our second speaker. So with that, I'll pass it over to you, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much. You, you forgot to mention that we are old colleagues from the European University Association. And Nicole yes, did indeed. a great job. We go way us. back. We go indeed. way back. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to, to talk a little bit, not as much from the researcher perspective. I, I, I'll squeeze it in if I can in, in the end. But maybe from, from the, the, the perspective of, of what I do and if you might say, what, what do I do? I'm crudely speaking a lobbyist for the university sector. So we have at UA, as Nicole said, uh, we are, let's say, the, the big representative of Europe's universities. Um, 800 something members across 48 countries. So uh, we're running around many places, including Brussels and saying, you know, you should allocate enough money, you should give good regulatory framework for universities. Um, I look at uh, generally horizon scanning, what will happen in the near future that directly or indirectly uh, will affect universities. I do policy development, and this is probably what I'm going to spoke, talk a little bit about today. So what do we think as EUA and why do we think that? And advocacy, getting the message to the right people. And that's that's probably sort of the the, the thing that is, is the most relevant to, for today. Um, so at EUA, we build our messages on evidence. So this is very much, you know, the, the research angle to it. We just don't come out and say something because we dreamt it yesterday. We, we, we try to have some evidence behind it. And I, I'll show you some examples later. Um, we do, of course, desk research. We um, see what's out there, but, but in, in 
this is in many other sectors. Uh, I actually spoke to a researcher earlier today and he was, ah, there's this book. I was just about to say to him, you know, I don't have time to read books. Uh, if if it, it's the policy world is a place where you say, you know, this is a really good report, but you know, it's 50 pages. So um, we never have time to read it. Um, we do a lot of evidence that's produced by ourselves, however. And that's what I'm going to, to show you as well, uh, where we use our membership base to get data that we can present as arguments for what we say. And that you should think is great. You have arguments, desk research, evidence, uh, and, and once you present that good argument and that great evidence, uh, the point is made because that's often how it is in, in the research world. Um, however, that's only half the story. And I think that's the first step if you want to make an impact policy-wise. Evidence is just not enough. You can throw evidence out there, but you need to basically shove it down people's throat. You need to get it to where they are. And in order to do that, you of course know, need to know what it is you want and who it is you want it from. You need to know where to go and who you talk to. And sometimes that's only two people, two, three people, um, but they, those are the right ones. Sometimes it's broader. I'll show this in the examples. Um, and then it's not about presenting the evidence in the way you think is rigorous and right. It's presenting a narrative that fits the story of that other person you want something from. And, and that's, uh, I think I could end my talk here, but that's basically what, what is needed. Um, and you'd be surprised how many times you see that people don't understand that. that the, it's the other person's perspective that's important. So I'll give you, I'll give you some, uh, some examples from that. So we have Brexit and that was of course a very classic sort of advocacy exercise. You have an event, uh, unexpected, but once it happens, you see um, what, what will this mean for Europe's universities? And we very quickly identified that what was important was to keep the UK in the EU research and, you know, and, and education programs. Um, and then you have to say, why, why do you want this? Why, once because UK is such a strong player in, in research and education. And, and here comes the narrative of the other side. The, the other side of this point being the Barnier team within the European Commission, showing it's not against the red lines of the EU. And we did that actually very, very quickly afterwards saying, you know, there's paragraph this, there's paragraph that. It shows that this is doable within the treaties. You can have associated countries. Actually, this is a very easy thing. It was something we also gave, went to the parliament and other places and said, this is a very easy thing because you can see the regulatory framework already can accommodate that non-EU uh, members are, are in these programs. Um, what is important here when you talk about the EU task force, so the Banya team and the parliament, is that these were not our usual suspects. These were not people that worked with universities. They were different. They did not come from our sector. They did not at some times know these programs. They would know Erasmus, but it was not a given that they would know Horizon 2020 as it was back in the day. Um, they don't know who we are. Uh, I remember going to the first meeting with the European Parliament and um, uh, the person said, ah, we expected you. We knew someone like you would exist, but we didn't know who you were. Uh, and I think many researchers will face the same challenges. They, you, you have a dialogue with people where there's no knowledge of the discipline you work in. There's no prior knowledge of the topic, at least that's a, in the scientific sense, and there's no prior knowledge of you. You might be a superstar in your field, doesn't mean that the uh, people will know you. So I'll just, I'll just show you what, what we did, if I can get my children to show. This is 
the joy of working from home. Um, so I'll just do a screen share here, see if it works, and you see what, what we then did uh, to, to be able to, to talk to people. And what we did, I'll just zoom out here, and I'll zoom tells me all kinds of stuff, was this thing that was more like a visiting card, an infographic, something that, as I said, people don't have to read. It's a lot of numbers. 330,000 publications produced in collaboration between EU and European researchers. Here is where you can see, if you look at the right, in your country, how many papers were co-authored with Brits. Um, how many projects are coordinated? 20% of all Horizon 2020 pro projects were at that time coordinated by British universities, etc., etc., etc. What happens if the UK is not in a project? And you can see, because people would say, well, you know, any kind of country can, can enter Horizon 2020. It's actually not closed. But if you're not associated, what happens? You can see how small even the biggest partner, the US, is compared to the United Kingdom. Student mobility, 28% of students um mobile students in europe go to the uk so two pages printed a nice thick paper you the first thing you can do in your meeting with these people that don't know you is to give them this in the hand and go through it with the argument i'll just stop sharing here with the argument saying this is why it's such a good deal to get the the um, the uk in these EU programs. You could have written the same on 10 pages, but you cannot give 10 pages to somebody who has this as a sort of sidekick in, in the important part. And you have to know as well that we were not the important part. We were not Northern Ireland. We were not, um, uh, we were not trade. There were many more, we were not defense. There are many more things that that were more important so so that's that's one example and what you want there is one thing and that's one way of doing policy impact it's probably not what most researchers do but it's you get one you want those association agreements to happen were we successful we actually don't know i mean we were not successful with the rasmus the uk is not part of the rasmus program they everybody say they want to be part of the horizon program but uh, that has not happened yet. I'm sure it will happen, but it hasn't happened yet. So that, that's, that's one example of how this is done. And you say, you, you ha we have all these numbers, that's desk research. These are basically things you can find on the UNESCO website and on, on various uh, EU websites. Another example from the same years is the much broader topic of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So back in 2016, you have the populist wave, Trump, Brexit, et cetera, et cetera. What, what does that mean for universities? One of the things were that we had like, you might remember in the, in the Brexit campaign, people are tired of experts and things like this. Universities could not and cannot afford to be seen as elitist and away from the real people. And although it was, of course, not possible to say, you know, we, we don't mind the populist being in, in, in power since they were so completely anti-science, we still want to show that universities are, have a social side and are inclusive places and are places that um, is not, not bastions of the elite. So who do we want that from? I said, you need to, to, um, to know who you want it from. Here, it's a little bit more difficult to say. You want it from policymakers. You want it in the public debate because you want to do influence perception, which is probably what many other, or, or what many researchers would want to do in the long run. You want to um, influence the perception of your field and of, the, of your topic. So, uh, the audience here was mainly 
what we did, I'll show one of the things we did, the higher education policy community. People that know the issues, but don't have the evidence. People that you want to make this argument, universities are socially inclusive places, um, but they don't have the evidence and they itch for it. So what you do is you create an evidence base. You, you identify this as a problem, you say that, and that is of course a step most researchers won't take because that's what they do anyway. But, but for us, you create that, that evidence base. And um, I will show you a little bit what we did. Let me just do another share. So here it's not about having a fancy chart. Here we did a whole report, 50 pages. And so I said, you don't do this for policy, but for this audience, you could do it because we wanted people that were already engaged to give them good arguments. And we wanted this to say, when we are in a policy context, and there were some discussions in the Bologna process, for instance, we wanted to have a, a, a full report to show them that we are the ones with the evidence and the arguments. And what are then the arguments? And I won't go, go through all of it. I'll go here just to show you one thing that uh, just zoom in. Say, why do universities do that? Why do universities have specific policies for social inclusion, uh, equity, and diversity? And here you see 88% said it's an explicit value for our institution. You can turn that into a policy me message and say, universities do this because they want to, because it's part of their DNA. And it's not as much because somebody else tells them and forces them to do this. So you don't message to policymakers. You don't have to force universities to do this. They already think that they should do this. You can then talk about how solid this is. It's, it's a self-select uh, sample, but still you know, 90%. It's, it's pretty good. Um, if I can just find one more, and I didn't write the, the you can see lots of text. Um, the page number for that one is, yeah, I think here you go, I'll just it will show up. So what are the, what are the issues? Because one of the things we had was in some context, you can talk about diversity, but it's binary gender and disability, and that's it. And here we could actually show, so what are the, the dimensions? We ask the universities, what are the dimensions of, of diversity that you work on actively? And just to say to the students, it's a lot of different things. It's disability, it's gender, it's ethnic migration background, socioeconomic background. And here, and this is a, this is a high one, if you think about the sample, uh, which was pan-European, uh, sexual identity, et cetera, et cetera religious background, I believe it was half of them. So you say, not only are universities very keen on doing this and they do this because they really want to, but they also have a, a, a fairly um, detailed and sophisticated ways of doing this where they look at many dimensions of, of diversity. I'll just stop the share there. So, um, this is to show that uh, sometimes you need that, that evidence base, but you need to boil it down to those headlines. If you, for instance, want to use it in the press. So you come out with a report, a journalist sees there is a report, that's a story, and you'll be interviewed. In an interview with the press, you'd usually have, if you're lucky, three quotes. You talk to them an hour, you get three lines. So you need to have those headlines. I gave you some here. Universities are doing this because they want it themselves. They don't need to be pressured into it. They have very sophisticated uh, ways of, of dealing with diversity. That's, that's much, much beyond simple, you know, let's get more women into to STEM disciplines or, or similar. Uh, and you, you can have that full report and it, it, it was well read this report. Um, but many will know you from the, those sound bites in the press. So you need, you need to prepare those in advance. Um, Nicole, how am I doing on time? Can I come with one more example? Yeah, you have about eight minutes left. So you're ah, okay. okay, 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 so we're good. So these were examples from uh, sort of the policy world. Um, 
before I came to UA, as Nicole said, I was a historian and I dealt for a part of a decade of my life, I dealt with 1968, which is a highly politicized topic. I think much less so now than it was when I, when I started back in around, around 2000. Mm. And the political discourse often goes, was it good or was it bad? Was it, you know, uh, fifth column communist movement? Was it something that destroyed all that was good and true in our traditions? Or was it a, um, a clean break with an overly traditionalist and restrictive society and a liberating moment for, for, uh, for Europe? A and uh, the historian will always go, it's complicated. No, no, it's much more complicated than that which is true um, because it, it always is. But that narrative, it's complicated. It's just not good enough if you want some kind of impact. So uh, what you can say is, for instance, and that, that was something we used, uh, myself and, and, and co my co-author, particularly from one book, was True, a lot of things changed in 1968. It was a part of a longer societal transformation, but it was not that the world was turned upside down from, um, from one day to the other in May or whenever that significant date was in, in, your, in your system. Um, but those things are nice, but it's, it's probably not the coolest thing you found in your research, this overall, uh, uh, this overall conclusion. Um, so sometimes you want to make the, the knowledge and those things that are really in reality interesting, particularly in history. Um, you, want, you, you need to remember that knowledge is fun. And you, make, you, you need to make the story relatable and you can actually tell about some of these experiences you have while you do research so for a historian that's of course often in the archives so uh, one sort of subplot to the 68 story is of course the, uh, the 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 feminist movement and you can make that relatable by saying you know i was flipping through all these magazines and they were all written for and by men and i won't give you any details but it's, it's actually quite shocking if you read through, you know, political uh, magazines from 1968. And obviously women were not part of 1968. They were not seen as an active part. And feminism was a revolt against the male hippies as much as it was a revolt against any, anything. So you can get that, that point through, but you can also sort of tell about that fun moment when you realized, oh, this was not what I thought. This was really, really... Um, this is really, really different. So where I want to, to, to end, I suppose we also have some time for questions, is um, that research experience is extremely helpful. And I think you can, you can turn any research experience into being very helpful. Uh, what you say in history is that history is another country. You go to some place strange and you understand, and, and people do strange things and they say strange things. And your job is to understand why does that make sense to them? And that is exactly what you do in advocacy. You go to somebody and you say, okay, I know what this person is. You, know, you, you need to do your research and, and, and see a little bit what, what is the discourse that happens on the other side. It's strange, but I understand why. And I'm able to fit my evidence and my story and my point to their narrative. And that's, that is where you meet them. You meet, meet them by understanding them where they are. And that is not like pushing a button. It doesn't work just like, like that. But when you're lucky and things fall together well, you, you can get, you can get that, that result or you can be part of that result. And that in itself, I think, is hugely satisfying. So I will, I will end there. I hope that was, that was helpful.
get a little view on the world in Brussels and how we yes. do things. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I definitely wrote down quite a few tips that you shared there and you gave a lot of different examples of in terms of thinking of scope and who your audience is and how as you know a researcher to get your message across in different ways. So it gives us a lot to think about. So um, I just, just to summarize some of the points that you made um, in terms of like sharing your in um, the infographic to introduce yourself because like you said, we're kind of a, an anonymous researcher in an institution that someone's never heard of. So being aware of, you know, not everyone knows you or your research or what it means or the background. So that context is important. And, you know, displaying that in a digestible manner to someone for the first time, like maybe an infographic of your research is like a new kind of e-business card type deal of overview of who you are as a researcher and what you can bring to the policy table. Um, and then some of the other things you said also was um, researchers can have the tendency to be like, oh, I can't explain it in a soundbite. And, and in Ireland and the UK, they always say, make an elevator pitch of your research or your narrative. And, and the thing that stuck out to me with your advice is sometimes the overall general conclusion might not be the most impactful in when it comes to the policy audience, maybe it's those, you know, unique pieces in the research and the more, you know, nuance that's actually more effective to, to share and communicate. So that's what I took away from, from your advice. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I will we'll get to the questions at the end. I think there's a couple in the chat, but just to make sure that each speaker um, goes and then sometimes there could be links or overlaps between the three speakers. So um, to look at the questions at the end. So for now, I'll pass it over to Claire, who will introduce our next speaker. Yes. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing our second speaker, Meg Munn. Currently, Meg is the Pro Chancellor and Deputy Chair of the Board of Governors at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK. Between 2001 and 2015, Meg was an MP in the British Parliament, which included being Minister for Women and Equality from 2005 to 2007, and then a Minister at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 2007 and 2008. Since her time in Parliament, she has worked around the world, in the Middle East, North and East Africa and the Pacific, on issues related to democracy, such as leading induction programs for new MPs, capacity building for strengthening parliamentary institutions, and mentoring women MPs, with multiple organizations such as the Interparliamentary Union, UN Development Programme, the OECD, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, and finally, the place where I met Meg, at Global Partners Governance. Please take it away. Thanks very much, Claire. And uh, yes, we had uh, some very interesting times working at Global Partners uh, Governance on those issues. And um, with such a, a full introduction, I really don't need to say a, a great deal more about myself, except I'm, I'm, I'm going to very specifically talk about um, policy as a politician, so how academics or researchers uh, relate to uh, politicians. And um, I, I sort of started off when I, Claire asked, first asked me to do this, just writing down some differences about us. And I, I've just got one slide, which I'm going to, um, uh, to show you um, about what I think those differences are. So uh, a quick idea, so oops. here we go. Okay. Um, so um, here are some differences <laughs> between politicians and academics and maybe a little bit exaggerated to make the point, but actually maybe not. So first off, uh, language. Ac academics um, have uh, a lot of complex language. Um, I know this, I sometimes get to interview academics in my role at Sheffield Hallam University and uh, and some of the time I, at the end of the evening, I go, really had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and um, whereas politicians, by our very nature, we need to communicate, we need to talk to ordinary people. So a, a good, effective politician will speak in uh, plain language. Academics, um, main um, writing is around academic documents. And uh, my goodness, you don't have to write some long paragraphs. Um, whereas um, politicians are writing speeches and uh, it was very 
interesting for me when I first was uh, elected to Parliament and I started to see the speeches that politicians were making. I came from, uh, I'd been a social worker, uh, social work manager before that, so I was used to written documents, but speeches, they're often quite short paragraphs and they're often written in a particular way to, uh, to have impact. Um, what are academic uh, documents trying to do? Well, maybe a little unfairly, I'm saying seeking to impress. I, I kind of, uh, uh, my experience with Sheffield Hallam University has uh, let me into the world of academia a little bit. And there's, uh, I know there's uh, often uh, a bit of competition and uh, friendly and unfriendly competition around producing uh, documents and the like. So, so they may be seeking to impress. They're, pa they're about passing qualifications. You know, are you going to get your degree? Are you going to... Uh, um, get published, all of those kind of things. So they're written with very specific purposes and they're often written to be read by other academics. Um, whereas politicians, when they're writing things, if you're writing articles, you're writing something for a newspaper or you're making a speech, you're seeking to persuade, you're trying to get people to uh, agree with your argument or you're demolishing somebody else's uh, argument, you're trying to paint a picture. Um, I think Thomas has already talked about this, um, uh, the academic process can be quite complex. You can't very easily, because of your detailed understanding of a complex issue, reduce it down to something that's very, very simple. Um, and the politicians were often trying to achieve through policy simple goals, get more people into work, build more houses, uh, get more women into work, get more women into parliament. The, the, the goals appear very simple. Um, the reasons behind them can be complex, the reasons behind that they don't happen, but that sense of that's what we want. Stop telling me how difficult it is or the complexities of it. That's what we're trying to achieve. That's what Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith or whoever I meet when I knock on the door, which is what politicians do in the UK, that's what they want to know. Don't tell me all about this. There was a fantastic um, interview yesterday morning uh, between on the BBC with the with uh, Boris Johnson and the UK Prime Minister, and uh, the interviewer was asking about energy costs and energy prices um, because that's a big issue at the moment in the UK. And the Prime Minister uh, said something about Russian hydrocarbons. Well. <laughs> What does Russian hybrid carbons mean? And the interviewer, not surprisingly, he said, Prime Minister, I'm asking you about the fact that ordinary people's gas bills are going up. What on earth have Russian hydrocarbons got to do with it? But of course, we know that Russian hydrocarbons, if we think about it, have probably got quite a bit to do with it, but that's not what politicians need to tell ordinary people. So as politicians, we can understand, we can grasp complex issues, but we need them to be um, framed in a much clearer way. Um, research takes time. You know, really looking into something takes a lot of time. And uh, I know I sometimes looked at uh, things in academia and thought, could, could I uh, get engaged in something like this? Would I be interested in, in researching stuff? I find loads and loads of things fascinating, but you know, the time you have to take to set something up, your protocols, if you're interviewing people, all of this would frankly drive me bonkers because that's not what I'm used to doing. I'm used to, you know, trying to move ahead um, much more uh, in a much more streamlined way. And so politicians are looking for solutions to problems that they're facing now. And um, again, really exaggerated probably, uh, the last one, it's about being thought oriented in, in academia, you get interested in, in the process, you get interested in all sorts of things, whereas uh, policy uh, for politicians is all about being action oriented. So um, I'm going to, hang on, I, I don't, it's a new share, I don't want to, new share, I want to stop share. Ah, there we are, in red, should be easy. Again, I asked for something easy and red stop share should be easy. So, so what, what would I say to people who are wanting to influence politicians to, to really get their message across? I think the first thing is being really, really clear is about what is the question that you're trying to answer? Um, too often, I used to get research documents and I would think, why is somebody researching this? 
um, my first two years in Parliament, I was on the Education Select Committee. And so I received every single document of research that was published um, and had been funded by the Department for Education. And frankly, sometimes you're thinking, why on earth are we looking at this? What on earth is this about? So that real, if you're wanting to interview, influence public policy, be really, really clear about what is the question you're trying to answer. It's really important to provide information to prompt change. When I first became a minister, so I was a minister for women and equality, and I was based in the Department of Trade and Industry. And all of a sudden I came across one or two facts which really made a difference to me, facts that I then, uh, that came out of research, which I was then able to use in speeches as part of my aim to persuade. So to give you one example, and I'm going to refer to the university where I'm now a governor, wasn't at the time, but Sheffield Hallam University did some research which found that 50% of women who work part-time were working below their skill level. And I probably I couldn't tell you what the rest of that research said, but that single fact from that research was enormously important and enormously helpful to me. So our government wanted to do more to enable women to work in jobs at their skill level, at their skill level, not below that. And there was also a lot of research around which found that the key point was um, at the second child. Often somebody who had a first child could return to work and manage the childcare. And I say somebody, I mean a woman, um, and they could manage uh, that. It was the second child that made the difference. So having that information really, it's not a policy solution at that point, but it prompts you down that route. Another one um, uh, Thomas mentioned about women in STEM. 70% of women who have qualifications in science, engineering and technology don't work in science, engineering and technology. But, you know, and yet in the UK, we have a dearth of engineers. So those, what I came to call killer facts, uh, were hugely, hugely important. And um, I was so impressed by these that we actually got the civil servants to collate killer facts for every part of the Department of Trade and Industry. At times, I have to say, it was a bit of a struggle getting them to understand what a killer fact is. It's, it's not just something that describes a situation. It's something that prompts you to make a change, to look at policies to, to change something. So when you come up with some policy solutions, what are the kind of things that I, as a former politician, policymaker, uh, would uh, think about when testing out that? My first thing would be, are your recommendations, your policy solutions realistic? Firstly, don't give me 40. <laughs> you know, give me five, give me 10, give me three, give me one. You know, it's one policy thing that's going to make a difference. Understand that policy landscape that you're in. So there's a lot of evidence around there about the negative impact of uh, tests in school. Again, I'm talking about the UK policy. Um, environment. We have been testing children in schools, I think now for the best part of 20 years, probably 20 years, maybe even a, a little bit more. And the that was on the back of this sense of parents need to be able to choose their schools for children, uh, choice will drive up uh, attainment. And one of the ways that parents will know which school to send their kids to is by testing and will know through testing kids how good or not a school is. Well, there's loads of research about really how beneficial those are. There's loads of research about teachers teaching kids to test and children not getting a wider education. All of that um, is important and interesting, but a policy that comes up with saying, stop testing full stop, isn't gonna fly because the, um, political environment is such that that is now so much part of the landscape that the research will likely get completely dismissed. So look at recognizing that at a certain point, you're just gonna be banging your head against the brick wall. You might still want to do it, that's fine, but understand that that's what you're doing. And if you really want to influence and get a change, think about what are the ways in which that might be uh, done that is less in uh, less 
you're not asking for the big change, but you can try and get some changes which would move the policy more in the direction of what you wanted to go with, or come up with something really alternative that would meet the requirements of what the politicians want for whatever the reasons that they've come up with, um, and then go with that, but really understand that in environment. I'll give you another example on that. Yesterday, there landed in my inbox some research from a university about the gender pay gap. Now in the UK, um, companies have to provide information on the gender pay uh, if they're over a certain level. And this report, nice uh, catchy headline, basically said that gender pay gap reporting in the UK has no teeth. So you've got all these reports, but, but nothing happens. One of their recommendations, I may be, uh, you know, I read this quite quickly, but uh, one of their recommendations was the need to have somebody actually, uh, some accountability mechanism for that. And I'm sitting there thinking, mm, we just had a pandemic. <laughs> Yeah, business is in a terrible state, the economy's really struggling, and uh, the last thing that businesses will want, and therefore the last thing that politicians will want, is to say, okay, here's something else that you're going to have to do, which they're not going to see is mainstream. Now, we can make all the arguments we want about having more women uh, in your organisation, uh, ensuring that women are properly paid. We can make all of those organisations, but what people are first going to see, their first reaction is another body that I've got to report to, another bit of bureaucracy that isn't going to help me. So it, um, it, it, may, it may be interesting, but, um, and it may be true, and it may be something that you want to put into the conversation as the fact it's got no, but recognise what are things like at the moment um, and is that a realistic recommendation that somebody's going to pick up and, and run with at this point in time? And also, uh, who are you talking to about it? Um, Thomas was talking about know your audience. It's going to be very different if you're talking to um, a, a party whose ideology is very much about uh, equality and social justice as opposed to a, a party whose ideology uh, doesn't include that. So again, you've got to think about who you're talking to, how you want to do that. Communicating right, you know, get the language right, make sure that um, the people you're talking to um, understand your language, make your language their language. And if you're not sure what that is, find out, spend a bit of time listening to people talking about the, the issues you're concerned about uh, and find out what they say. Um, there's plenty of means to do that. So as I say, is it the right issue, the right time, the right place? Are you really confident that you've got enough information that it's strong enough that you can put it across in a way which can change the nature of the debate? So if you really want to go into the issue of stop testing young children in school, you know, you're really, really confident that you've got some issues about that. Make sure you've got it all there because you're not, you're only going to get one chance at this. You know, if people can strike down your uh, your views very quickly with some counter issues you're not going to get very far and I understand that it can be quite hard to um, sometimes to find people who disagree with you when you work in a certain world uh, one of the issues that I've worked on a lot and um, which was highlighted is about uh, women in politics and gender and those issues and I was at a conference once with an academic who I've got a great deal of respect for who does some fabulous work in this area and um, and we were talking about trying to persuade people to undertake gender audits in, in parliaments. And, and this academic said, I've never met anybody who didn't agree with me on this. And I'm like, oh, well, come into my world. And, and so we did a role play and, you know, and, and it was actually great fun. And that ability to test out and, and to, you know, it, one of the reasons politicians get good at their arguments is because we're in a contested space. And uh, we're constantly refining, trying to get our issues across. So find people who disagree with you, <laughs> find other, you know, and actually take on those issues. Um, one of the uh, suggestions that I've got is that sometimes you need to think about, does your academic research need mediating through another organization? And I'm an organization which is perhaps closer 
and uh, ready to take on the issues in a way that the people you're trying to influence would understand. So um, get going with this theme of gender in, in politics, the Interparliamentary Union, which is the organization of all parliaments across the world, uh, has taken up um, a lot of that research. And there's a there was a really interesting process that went on, particularly into what, what we call gender sensitive parliaments. Uh, I've just come back from um, uh, Malta looking at making their parliament more gender sensitive. Great, isn't it? Gender sensitive. What on earth does that mean? How can a parliament be more gender sensitive? Well, um, again, getting the language right on that, making it uh, not only having more women there, but recognizing that men and women need different things from parliamentary buildings, whether that's about uh, the times that they work, whether about the legislation, is gender uh, uh, is analyzed from um, a gender perspective or whatever. But the, a lot of research has been done and some fantastic researchers have produced that information, which the Interparliamentary Union has published. So they published a document on gender sensitive parliaments and, and it was based on research around parliaments and there was some really good stuff in it. But a few years later, not a lot had happened. And so they decided to produce an action plan. So they produced an action plan and that was quite good, but still that wasn't quite hitting the spot. And so what they then produced was a toolkit to um, do an audit of parliaments to see how gender sensitive they are and now not only the Interparliamentary Union but the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, um, the uh, OSCE, other people are producing those, those toolkits and there are ways in which then help people to ask those questions in order to do a gender audit based and it all goes back to the research but the, the research has been mediated through an organisation uh, of which parliaments are members of which MPs are members and so they understand uh, that audience. So those are my suggestions, that's uh, my experience and I'll be very happy to take part in the uh, question and answers uh, a little later. Thanks so much for that Claire, I don't know if you have anything to add, yeah no, or we can keep going with the programme. I can quickly say that I think I took like two really key messages from that. I loved your um, killer facts, so yeah. facts that make a difference. And so really thinking about the, can I pull something out of my research that that's short, concise, and someone will look at it and go, that's not okay, we need to change this. And then also the other thing I really took away was really thinking about the context, the political context under which you'd like to make change and is it realistic? How can I approach it? And that sometimes incremental change might be just as useful, if not more useful than wild radical change, if that's what the political context calls for. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for speaking. I really enjoyed listening, especially to your experiences and been taking notes as well. So <laughs> perfect. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, so now we'll go over to Akuda who will introduce our final speaker and then we can engage in the Q&A session afterward. Great. Sounds great. I already have two pages of notes and I'm hoping to take even more. So I'm happy to introduce our final speaker, Marina Paguirello. She's a lecturer at the University of Essex, where she teaches political economy in the Department of Government, and she's also an associate lecturer at UCL. She has a PhD in European political economy from LSE European Institute, where she was a teaching fellow for European politics and public policy. Uh, before academia, she actually worked in educational policy as an educational policy researcher and specialist with national and international organizations and governments for over 15 years, uh, including work for the National Research Institute of the Italian Ministry of Labor and the Italian Ministry of Education. Um, Marina is a research associate for LSE Consulting, working on projects uh, in education for a wide range of clients. And lastly, where I know her from, uh, Marina is also a research director at 89 Initiative, working on the project Civic ed Education and Populism, where she examines the potential role of civic education to strengthen citizens' political autonomy. Um, yeah, so a lot of impressive work, and I'm happy to hear you speak. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Akudo. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I will try to complement uh, Thomas advocacy and Meg politics perspective with a more acad academic one, meaning I have more slides. So let me start sharing the screen. 
Okay, so you can all see, right? Yes. Okay, so very briefly, what I would like you know, to, to discuss in this uh, final part is, uh, okay, first of all, what happened in academia, why we are now also engaged with uh, <clears throat> policy making, what I call the rise of uh, the impact industry. And then, you know, some uh, insights on whether academia and policy making are indeed the two compatible or incompatible systems. And I will conclude with my experience for LSC Consulting and especially AP9 Initiative, which are two practical examples of how we try as academics to engage with the public. So actually before, you know, academics were not really so keen, no, in working for uh, uh, policy making and uh, engagement, in fact, were not even, not only the core of academic work, but they were not even mentioned in job descriptions. If many of the participants at a certain point you want to apply for a university, you will see that now the job descriptions requires you to generate research income and engage with the public. And now they are very important as well, even for promotion criteria. So if you can show, demonstrate that you know your research had an impact, that is sure that you know um, valued, uh, an added value in what you do. And now, basically, there is, as I was saying, this impact industry. I, I'm talking about the UK context because I'm from, I, I work in the UK, but that's very common now in many European countries in which you know, universities are much more keen than before on you know, performance and prestige and reputation. And even you know, before Thomas was mentioning you know, some European programs, but even now, if you apply for any European Research Council or Horizon 2020, you, know, you will be required to provide a very detailed information on how your research might benefit to non-academic audience. You are required to structure very clearly your engagement plan. What will you do? Will you do conferences, a dissemination, a blog, a newsletter, a website, and so on? And this has also meant that many universities have this sort of centers called you know, policy lab or consultancy lab or knowledge impact lab, and are also linked with, uh, for example, in the UK, the research excellence framework. So basically now compared to before, there is a much uh, bigger commitment for academics to impact on the real world. And this means, you know, uh, collaboration with the public, with activists, with civil society, with business, with stakeholders, and so on. Now, I was saying before, you know, our two incompatible systems, you know, what they call the ivory tower and the main street. So Akudo, in her very nice introduction, mentioned that it's true before academia, I, I was on the policy making side, I was in the main street. And for me, like mega bit, you know, I was struggling a bit when I entered academia and all these, you know, uh, very long and complex uh, concepts. They are incompatible because it's true there are you know, some differences um, sometimes before uh, the research community and the policy practice community. We do have different values and different expectations. You know, research is much more this a challenge function versus, uh, as uh, Thomas and you know Meg already underlined, you know, solving a problem in the real world in that specific moment. And then there is also this difference, you know, the concept of knowledge, you know, what is knowledge? For academics, sometimes knowledge is, you know, knowledge for its own sake, not, not so much to improve the world, but, you know, to add something to the world versus knowledge, which is much more um, linked to action and doing something. And then there are also different notions and different sources of evidence. I think this has already been I said very well by Thomas and, and by Meg, but it's true when we talk about evidence, uh, I'm not going to repeat what Meg already illustrated, you know, so, so nicely, but policymakers is much more, you know, colloquial, anything that seems reasonable, relevant to the policy, timely, engaged with the present, and a clear message. I think Thomas, in all the infographic, you know, uh, clearly illustrated this message that you need to be, you know, very clear in conveying what you want to say. And then we have the research as evidence, no? much more scientific, context-free, you know? And this uh, perhaps is, uh, to me, one of the biggest criticisms. Sometimes uh, the role of the context in academic research is very much overlooked, no? Maybe at the end of a research, of a paper, of an essay, whatever, you say, yes, but context matter. But, you know, we don't really study, I think, context as we should study. It needs to be proven empirically. 
we always start from the theory, right? We have the theory, we have the hypothesis, and then the empirical evidence needs to confirm or disconfirm the theory. And then a research is true, you know, as long as it takes. Uh, we are always told, you know, you never study the future. In the best of cases, you study the present, but what you really have to study is the past, which is, you know, completely different from what, you know, policy making should be. And then, you know, the famous caveat that, uh, and I think and this also emerged from Thomas and Meg, you cannot really answer to a policy making, to a policy maker, it depends. But, you know, that's the classic academic answer. Non-academic will tell you, well, is yes, is no, it depends. And then having said that, okay, should, should we expect then academics to, to achieve policy change? Well, some arguments might be against, you know, some people might say, you know what, there is a lot of academic research which has no policy relevance, as not, you know, so relevant to public policy, as not relevant to contemporary policy debates and agendas. Another criticism is that, you know, much more of the research doesn't really, you know, innovate, right, supports, uh, the policy status quo. And then, uh, and this is something which I think we have already you know, heard so well, politics and political capability almost always trumps evidence. So evidence you know, is sometimes a very catchy and nice word that is evidence-based policy making, but sometimes, you know, especially in our democracies, political considerations might be you no know, electoral costs and uh, uh, you know, voters' opinion and unions as a veto points, whatever, all these things will almost take precedence. And then something that uh, sometimes academics, you know, tend to forget that policy making is a very messy process, you know, it's path dependent, it's chaotic, and, you know, thinking that, you know, you could influence policy with your research sometimes might be a bit unrealistic because, as you know, everyone know, everyone who has been using policy making, personalities, informal contacts, you know, social contacts, relationships, much often, you know, determine policy decisions more than we might want to believe. So according, you know, to, to, to this criticism, uh, the answer to should we expect academics to achieve a policy change might be no. And this is, you know, the usually it depends on academia. However, if we want to change, you know, if we want to improve policy making, what academics should do? So first of all, more emphasis, investment, and time in selecting research that has the potential to change policy, even though you know, some arguments might say, well, what about academic freedom? You know, I want to study whatever I want. I don't want to study something to impact a specific policy, being education, housing, health, or whatever. Uh, second, very important, and this has already been said, you know, this is a key role of policy narrative. So getting the story behind the number, stories that resonate with decision makers. And this is also you know, a bit of a change which is uh, happening in academia. I mean, even in, in my universities now, you have a lot of uh, professional development courses on storytelling. So how to help academics to communicate the research findings in a very easy and catchy way. So uh, the, the issue of policy narratives, I think now is much more uh, uh, not only important, but much more uh, uh, considered important than before. And then uh, it is also important, you know, to think about, you know, whether academic researchers are also policy actors. So the, the policy entrepreneurs, those that, you know, try to, uh, to find solutions to specific, uh, uh, to specific problems. So after saying that, let me finish the second part of my intervention with my own experience. So Akudo was mentioning LSE Consulting and 89 initiatives, and these are basically the two things in which I, I am involved a bit more, in, not recently, but LSE Consulting since 2011. So LSE Consulting is an example of how universities now are creating these consultancies arm uh, to bridge the gap between academics and policy making. So this is just an example of you know, policy reports which are published and they have also, um, for example, the first one is you know, the big conversation, climate change, which was committed by the British Council. Uh, others, uh, for example, the client can be the European Commission or can be a specific uh, pharmaceutical company. And as you can see, you know, this is a bit, uh, I think, the empirical illustration of what I was saying before, so solving a real world problem, which is happening, uh, misinformation, 
uh, company profits in Italy, uh, vocational education and skills and the role with business and so on. So LSC Consulting is one example of what I mean of the rise of the impact industry. And then uh, the second example is 89 Initiative, which I think is a pretty nice example because uh, it shows how civil society, so how uh, really NGOs are trying to be part of this you know, big uh, university setting, in this case is uh, the LSE, but trying you know, to move and change policies with the help of academics. And the Tinan Initiative is a very young think tank, which is based at the European Institute of the LSE, which also has you know, regional chapters in Scotland, but in many European capitals as well. And what, the, what we do, basically, we do research programs. So we are academics that try to work with the civil society on different topics, uh, climate change, migration, innovation. And here, for example, in red is a civic education, because as Akudo was saying, that's exactly my, my research program. And um, this project that we are doing on civic education and populism I think illustrates a bit. So our project uh, is okay, it's very ambitious because we are trying uh, to understand uh, to what extent civic education uh, might, let's say, mitigate uh, populist trends and to what extent civic education uh, can provide young people with an epistemic uh, toolkit, let's say, to strengthen their political autonomy. So we, we consider the, the fragility of democracy in, in this moment, the vulnerability of democracy. So we focus on the link between education and populism, and we do several activities. And in these activities, we, we try uh, to engage much more than you know, produce academic research, even though we are all academics. So we try to produce research uh, which can engage the public and can foster you know, this dialogue between academia and civil society. For example, uh, we also launched recently with uh, APCG in the UK. These are all party parliamentary groups, uh, so basically members of the parliament, regardless of you know, the ideological orientation, who stay together on a specific topic. So in our case, is political literacy. And on the right, that's an example of our uh, recent report uh, on populism and democracy and the role of civic education. And as you can see in the end, uh, when we do recommendation, we always try not only to do recommendation in a strict sense, you know, in terms of policy makers, but also for academics. So basically that's our contribution uh, to bridging you know, this gap between academia and policy making, which is much needed because for example, one of the findings of our report, and here we did a lot of interviews, at least you know, 30 interviews with uh, stakeholders in Europe and civil society organizations working on civic education, despite, you know, in political science and in education uh, studies, uh, there is, you know, a bunch of articles on civic education. What emerged from our findings was that NGOs and all these small organizations, they have no idea about what's happening, you know, in academia. They have no idea about research, about, you know, the findings, so this is, again, an example to illustrate how important it is uh, to, to talk a bit more, but to, to bring, basically, uh, the civil society in the real world, you know, to academia rather than the way around, which is, uh, in the end, I mean, linked to what, you know, Thomas was saying in terms of, of the clear message, you know, the getting the message to the real people and the role of evidence, uh, and also what Meg, you know, was uh, telling about her, um, her experience. So very quickly, because uh, I, I would prefer, you know, to receive a lot of questions from you and you know, also for the previous intervention. Uh, what we, we, I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, yes, how can we bridge you know, this, this gap? Uh, yes, produce better quality evidence on problems and solutions. And sometimes you know, as academics, we, we forget you know, the problem and the solution. Improve dissemination strategies. And, and this is absolutely true. I mean, this has already been said. Sometimes academics are very difficult to understand and it was, even challenging for myself when I arrived at the LSC after you know, working 15 years in, as a, you know, in the world of policy analysis, policy making, I really struggled you know, with all the, this importance of theories because I was telling them, guys, you know, I, I did work in Italy at the Ministry of Education and you know, we, we just work on an emergency state every single day. You don't have time for theories. It's just, you know, it's, it's a completely different world. So, I, I completely understand that you know sometimes academics you know think that politics is this very you know, linear uh, process. So the importance of timing of you know serendipity of these you know windows of opportunity 
uh, policy making you know, is much more faster compared to academic research, which sometimes you know, takes years. And then again, engage in academic practitioner workshop or, or use you know, sort of knowledge broker. So these facilitators which try to you know, break down the cultural barriers and then also encourage as well, of course, policymakers to uh, appreciate you know, a bit more the role of evidence and also the way to distinguish you know, the source of evidence you know, from uh, the, the civil society, the lobbyist, the, the business, the expert, and the personal advisor. And I think I shall stop here and uh, thank you so much. So much for that. Um, Akudo, I don't know if you have any um, summarizing remarks before we go to Claire for Q&A. Yeah, just some really quick remarks. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. It was very interesting and really nice to hear just a variety of viewpoints of people who made the transition from uh, yeah, different times, either from academia to policy or policy to academia, politics to academia, policy, and so on. Um, I really appreciated your point about the rise of the impact industry. I really hope this is something that also comes home to a lot of academics. Uh, maybe this is more um, top of mind for those of them who are applying for grants and things now, but thinking about where we were five years ago, I think it's very new that all of a sudden you're now being asked to prove how much you engage with those outside of academia and how this is relevant to them and what is important. What are you giving back uh, in terms of societal knowledge and not just what you're giving back in terms of academic knowledge. Um, so I think that was very helpful. I also really very much like the point expressed by you and Meg as well um, about being aware about the larger political universe. It is fascinating to me that as academics, we are so extremely aware of every theory ever that could disprove or stand to prove or support or even just be tangentially related to anything we're doing. But when it comes to everything outside of academia, for instance, the windows of opportunity you mentioned, um, being able to translate research into quick facts that can be used that are powerful and impactful, it is a complete blind spot. We're really just blind to all these things happening in this world that we also apparently live in. Uh, so I really love that point as well. Um, and I love the giving the guided advice, but also mentioning the different places that academics can go to get this kind of knowledge and training. So the fact that so many universities now have a consultancy arm because of this very uh, rise of impact industry that you talked about, um, but also the fact that they're a practitioner website or a practitioner um, events that academics can participate in. And then the fact that there are organizations like 89 Initiative and other think tanks and NGOs who are very interested in bridging this gap that who are missing out on this complete wealth of knowledge being developed because we're just not interacting with them sufficiently. So those are my big takeaways. I really appreciated it. Thank you. Thanks, Akuto. Um, now we have time for the questions from the audience period. So I'll leave it to Claire to moderate this portion. Yes. So we've had a couple of questions in the chat. Um, however, I'd like to give those people that have written their questions the opportunity to actually ask it. Um, so our first question was, is there one of our panelists who would like to go first with that question? I, 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 could, I could take this. I, I, don't think, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a risk. As long as you stay true to the evidence and the method you, you use, as, as long as you think that it's scientifically correct what what you say, there's no there's no damage to your to your integrity. Um, it is if you begin to bend the facts to your political to the political message you want to you want to make, then of course there's a there's a there's an issue. But I think wider actually there's an issue if you don't engage with the public whatsoever. Because there is this, you know, the, the, the buzzword is co-creation. You learn a lot. There's a lot of knowledge there that's not academically codified, and that that you actually can enrich what you do if you're out in a dialogue. Because I mean, this is not a one-way policy. It's not a one-way conversation. So, so um, I, I don't think I don't think there's much of a risk unless you begin to bend facts because you want to have a political point. But then you should go into politics with all respect for politicians and people like myself. Um, but but if, if it's the policy message that's important and not the research, then you're in the wrong business. Uh, I'd just add one thing to it because again, it's about thinking about the environment you're going in to discuss that. So, um, and it comes back again to all the things I was saying about use of language. So if you are going to be interviewed about some policy, uh, uh, Thomas is uh, of course absolutely right. You stick with what your research said but you have to practice and think about, well, what are the questions, you know, the sort of obvious questions that somebody might ask about this? 
and what kind of spin might they put on this? So, you know, if your research is based on, I don't know, inter interviews with a thousand people, you know, the question might come, well, a thousand people isn't representative or if it, you know, or, or whatever, just think through the kind of, of, of things that people might ask. So that you're ready to respond in a way which is um, support your, uh, your research and um, and that you could, you've thought through every angle because there is always the danger that um, somebody who's not from your background who doesn't have all of that kind of information is going to ask you the type of question um, which uh, you've not practiced the response to. So so that's really what uh, what I think you have to think about. So what's the environment you're going into? What kind of questions are likely to get asked, and how would you? Responds to those which um, demonstrate and support the information you're putting across and don't undermine it. Sorry, yeah, I, like I, add, yeah. yeah I, I don't have much to add because I think Thomas and Meg said it perfectly. And you know, if if your data are you know robust and sound, and uh, you know you, you've done your research and you can you know corrob corroborate your uh, public statement or recommendation with evidence. Uh, you, you don't harm your in integrity. I'm not sure if Lindsay also meant uh, integrity in the sense of, you know, you don't want to expose yourself too much. You don't want to be, you know, depicted uh, as someone from the left or from the right or, you know, of a specific uh, ideology. This is something else, but uh, it's not about integrity. It's about, you know, you want to remain, you know, uh, in this uh, gray area as an academic. You don't want to be labeled as a someone who is a conservative or, you know, revolutionary and so on. But uh, I think, you know, one of the advice uh, would be, you know, to, to work a bit more with people different from you. So because, you know, sometimes academics, they just do the research with academics. They don't have an academic team or a research team in which you have, you know, a lobbyist or in which you have, you know, someone from the civil society. So I think this is also something which surely would improve uh, also, you know, the way you feel when you make a particular message, because it's not only about you as academic, but you have a team of people with different skills and, you know, people with different, you know, uh, exactly skills and values and so on. So one, one of the things that I also try to do with my 89 is that, you know, when you do research, it's not only academics, but it's also someone who, I don't know, who has a blog or someone, you know, who is an active citizen or someone who is a lobbyist and uh, I think this, you know, increases a bit the chances of uh, not only making an impact, but also you know, to, not to defend yourself a bit, but uh, you, you need a team, which is also sometimes outside academia. That's you know, what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to? Take yeah, maybe that on? I, I can start and then I can leave the floor to Megan Thomas. I mean, maybe I have a very boring answer to your super interesting question, but as far as you generate research income, okay, so as far as you are able you know, to bring money to the university, that's already something which matters a lot for career progression. I don't know if this was, you know, because your question was exactly, you know, how we ask to engage in policy, but, uh, you know, sometimes. Uh, this activity is not often contemplated. So if, if, you, if you bring money, and I don't know, now I'm thinking about the UK context in which you have a lot of you know, foundations that, uh, I don't know, in my field is the Joseph Rautry Foundation and Nuffield Foundation. I mean, all of them, they are looking forward you know, for academics to bring evidence and to bring research to, to improve uh, poverty and you know, childhood care and, and so on. So, one thing will be also, I think, you know, one thing which is missing a lot in academia, uh, even in the top universities of the world, is uh, to equip researchers uh, with more, you know, managerial skills, which are, you know, funding, of writing an application, of writing a proposal, uh, even writing a policy brief. You know, Thomas was talking before about all these infographics, but still in many universities, your assessment is an essay. And I always tell my students, you know, no one will care about the essay. As you know, no one will care about the 50 pages report. You have to do a policy brief and that's the assessment that we're going to do. So I think we also need a bit of change 
because we talk a lot about you know engaging but then many things are still very traditional so this also needs to change a bit and a researcher needs also to be equipped with more you know risk assessment uh, time management uh, uh, teamwork and so on great would anyone like to add anything it's a highly political question because it has to do with the framework conditions because it's in most countries these things are regulated like you have you know you can have it indirectly like in britain with the ref and you have to tick the box on impact uh, but but it can also be directly regulated in some countries that these things just don't count they just don't give points because you have a, a very rigid research assessment framework marina will be uh, familiar with anbor as a, as an example of a of a fairly rigid for for specific reasons i won't go into it but but it it's it's actually a, a, a political a political question if it is anything you also have this woke woke question i think university i i, I never understood why that is a why that is a derogatory term i think universities are woke by by nature because you come up with knowledge and that knowledge is sometimes uncomfortable again if your integrity is right if you if you do the right thing if you talk about you know the the societal perceptions of of gender or race and that that this is in stark contract to to contrast to our uh, sort of other our moral and and ethical uh, principles of society um i think that is a straightforward scientific argument and if that's knowledge then it 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 uh, it deserves to come to to come out there so i think it's it's about and i'll be political again but that's my job um it's about unmasking the, the that argument and then but then then comes my, my important point who are you who are you telling that to we can tell it to each other and say oh that's a wonderful argument and of course we want to be or be in that but what are the audience that those that that point the woke stick what are the audience that trying to mobilize with that can you try to come at the counter argument that works for that audience what is the counter argument for instance you know we just produce knowledge and if we didn't produce knowledge that was uncomfortable then we shouldn't be here you shouldn't pay us because then it doesn't make sense we're here to push things forward things like this you know utilitarian arguments maybe over ethical arguments and um, but you need to think about that uh, but again, it's, it's a political language question. Thank you very much. I'd like to actually quickly read out a comment uh, because it links to a question that I've got. Um, so she says, thank you very much to all the speakers for sharing their insights. I see the need for universities in Europe to develop public engagement trainings for researchers and initiate science communication activities, bringing together academics, policymakers and the media. Researchers are expected to do it all by themselves, but it would be good to support their efforts at, institute, at the institutional level. And I wondered about, did you, do you have any practical recommendations for us as academics for in, enabling us to communicate? Um, uh, so seeking out that bridge, right? So um, communicate between those seeking out academic research and those producing it. Do you have any yeah, practical ways of I, how I can find the right people, what I should be looking out for? Um, I, th I think it's, it isn't straightforward. But um, I think too often everybody just continues on in their own, own world. And there's as many politicians who, who aren't taking advantage of research that uh, exists and could really help them in, in what they're doing as, as there, there are um, academics who are not engaging uh, more, more publicly. So, um, and from the kind of work that, that we were doing in the past, Claire, in, in sort of working on uh, democracy and developing um, um, countries who've not got a lot of investment in their parliaments in uh, and government etc one of the things we often say to them is that you know use your local universities use what they know to help you in what you're doing so so I think it has to be um, uh, continuing to educate people about the benefits of this so that they can start to do it so what would i suggest to um the researchers as, as opposed to uh, the politicians i think it's really try to get to know the policy landscape um for the area that you're working in 
who who's acted in that area? Um, we uh, Marina talked about using all party parliamentary groups as a way directly into politicians and um, and to policymakers. They're a fantastic way if there's one um, uh, in the UK in the area that you're engaged in. Um, not all parliaments, not all countries have similar things. They would tend to be in in areas which are which are better funded. But find out find out you know where uh, where politicians engage on that. In terms of policy and uh, that interface with the uh, production of policy and political parties and, and all of that, the think tanks are, are, are often the way that these kind of issues are mediated. So again, understanding who's active on public policy. Obviously, there are big think tanks um, that work right across uh, public policy. There are others who are very active on issues such as say housing or or you know whatever the particular issue is is that uh, that you're interested in but really try to look who's already there um it's great if uh, your university the people you're with has got that uh, the kind of setup that marina said because that's the way in already it's already uh, fixed in but if yours hasn't um if your institution hasn't got that Find out who's there and, and go to their events. All of these organisations have events uh, because they're always trying to influence uh, people. They, um, the Conservative Party conference is ongoing in, in the UK at the moment. And outside of what's happening in the conference hall, the most interesting aspect of it is all the events that are happening there, which are being funded and held by organisations who are trying to influence uh, political parties and uh, and the government and policymakers. So, if you've if if you wanted to get a really good look at policy uh, making, go to one of the major political conferences that, that's happening, or get hold of you know get hold of their program. Find some way of of, of knowing that will immediately give you an idea of what what the landscape is and and uh, who you might need to be in touch with on that uh, there's there's no there's no substitute for networking on all of these things going to conferences um, but going outside of the world of academia um, and actually meeting the people who are on there that will really help you as a researcher to understand the uh, the policy landscape just to add uh, it is true but sometimes you know you don't always have support so try to be proactive so even you know writing to a policymaker or to a stakeholder and saying listen you know we are doing this module on whatever would you like to come and do a guest lecture trust me that you know they sometimes uh, they they will be you know the, the first people to be happy to come to the university and talk and then again do, do not only go to academic conferences but also go you know to all the other conferences and find the opportunities by yourself because uh, Apart, you know, being in a super top again environment where you have all the institutional support, it never happens. So be proactive and find your own opportunities. It seems, you know, given for granted, but uh, I think it is exactly like it is. At least that was my experience. Thank you. I'd like to have a floor back to Nicole because I think she's going to ask a final question. Yes, thanks so much. Um, the discussion is so good. I feel like we could go on for much longer, but I am conscious of the time. But maybe one kind of question to end on would be the scope of research and policy making. So, you know, for example, if you have some killer facts and you have a research expertise and you want to get, you know, delve into this area, what would you say would be the, the scope of the research needed that, you know, a researcher could approach policy making and policy makers? Because, for example, if they did a very small closed study, but it had some killer facts, would that be enough? Or would they need to do quite a broad, you know, survey and have a lot of different types of evidence and data to actually, you know, impact with, with policy making. So it's a question of research scope uh, in terms of delving into policy. And then um, that was my last question. So I'm not sure if there's anyone who wants to yeah. take this. Would anyone like to grab it? Yeah, I'd say it doesn't have to be big, not necessarily. It comes back to the point I made. What's the question you're trying to answer? You yeah. know, what's prompted the research? So, um, and, the killer fact 
that comes out of it might not be what you're necessarily expecting. So, you know, I quoted the Sheffield Hallam research, which is must be you know at least 15 years old, if not longer. But, you know, they were looking at women in part time work and they were probably, I would imagine, I'd have to go back and look at it, looking at a whole range of issues. But the one, you know, it, I suppose what part of that learning may also be you might, as the researcher, not be aware of what the killer fact is because it's somebody else coming at it with the things that bother them and the things that they're concerned about who might pick out that killer fact. So um, I think if you're very, very clear about what's the question you're trying to answer, what's the evidence, uh, you know, that's supporting your statements and claims at the end, then that in itself should be sufficient. But again, getting to the right people and putting it in, in the right places um, might uh, might be the, be the key aspect of that. So, so I don't think it has to be massive. It just has to be really sound and really clear. Yeah, I would, I would second that. If you have the killer fact, go for it. Uh, mm. Although it's, it's absolutely true what makes sense you'd actually don't know what the killer fact is because before you send it out there. But if you have something that you think is of, of general interest, then just go for it. Um, the, the other thing is, I think it's very important that there are two, at least two kinds of sort of policy impact. There is the, you know, law X is going through parliament and I really want to change paragraph B. Get a professional to help you. That's That's really, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the reason why people are paid to understand policy processes and stakeholder mapping and these kind of things. And, and it, it, it's a very particular skill set. If you want to do influence, sort of influence public opinion, which I think what most researchers really want, then that, that is something you can be trained for, you know, to write an opinion piece in a, in a newspaper, uh, a policy brief, um, a network so you get to speak the right places where the right people will hear you i think that 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 works and there the yeah you need the killer fact because otherwise why would people why would people listen to you yeah so thank you very much that um all these discussions and questions were excellent and we even have a note of thanks um, from another person in the comment as well asking for follow-up from today's event because um, they would like to incorporate it into their own communication strategy. So I'll just um, share with you also that Studio Europa is a good uh, resource as well for the, um, connecting. So I'll share with you, um, the studio has its website with events like today's. We do invite any researchers, um, particularly in the UM community or elsewhere to submit um, to the Studio Europa's um, policy brief section. So on their website, I have the link there. Um, there are examples of existing policy briefs that have been published through the studio. And we also welcome you to consider today's advice and the context of your research and see how you might be able to contribute a policy brief and um, make connections there. So again, I would really like to thank today's speakers um, and also for Akuto and Claire for your and all of everyone who attended who has some lovely questions. Again, feel free to get in touch with us and on social media and through the website and stay tuned for follow-up. So thanks everyone for coming and with that I will uh, close today's session.